working? It's red. How y'all doing? Okay. We made it to the final session, so you're still here and you're with us. So, uh, well, good afternoon. Welcome to GovCon. Come on in. Uh, you're in the session of migration is a terrible thing to waste, a roadmap for your next big content migration. My name is Dave Look. I'm the CEO of Chromatic, and I'm joined with Mark Dorison, our CTO. Uh, we've been friends and business partners for, well, we've been friends for a long time. We've been business partners for about 10 years. Uh, Chromatic is a digital agency. We've been around for over 16 years, and we've got a lot of experience building big websites and web applications, typically powered with a content management system, mostly Drupal, sometimes WordPress. Um, we're we spent a lot of time working in the open source space, uh, a lot of work with media and publishing clients, uh, a lot of brands that you might recognize outside magazine, the Meredith Publishing Enterprise, Better Homes and Gardens, Martha Stewart. Uh, we've done some hard work with Harvard University, uh, and currently we're working on a multi-million item content migration for the John F. Kennedy Library, um, migrating their digital asset management system from one system to another. So I think it's important to start out and define what we're talking about here when we're talking about a migration, especially because I've seen a bunch of really interesting talks here at GovCon that are also talking about migrations, but they're not necessarily talking about the same thing, or we're not all necessarily talking about the same thing. Um, we're not talking about an infrastructure migration, so taking a site and moving it from one hosting provider to another. We do plenty of those, but that's not what we're talking about today. Uh, we're typically talking about moving data from one system to another. Uh, generally, uh, in our case, at least one of those is a web CMS, often Drupal. Um, and also, and we'll touch on this a little bit, but we're typically talking about um, programmatic migrations as a big portion of uh, the migration. So. If we are dealing with a site that's like, well, we've got 200 content items, that's typically not the type of project that, that we're looking at. So um, you might approach that a little bit differently than we're talking about here. So we're talking about big content migrations, typically. Um, we're gonna approach it from the perspective of um, mapping the content and moving the content, but most essentially for today in our talk, we wanna talk about um, mapping it, improving it, uh, and then moving it. So how do we how do we improve during that process? So why migrations? Why migrations here at GovCon? Obviously there have been a bunch of talks on migrations, uh, so it seems to be a prominent topic right now. Our thought is that if you had a site for any period of time, you're probably gonna experience a migration, and if that site is gonna live on or your data is gonna live on for any period of time, you're gonna have to migrate it at some point in time. And we know migrations can be tricky. They're usually a headache for everybody involved. Um, and we know that they end up taking a lot longer than people anticipated. And our hope is that they don't have to be that hard or that frustrating. And they're a great opportunity to make things better, as Mark said. With a little bit of extra effort, uh, we can get a lot more out of our content. And uh, if nothing else, minimally, uh, we're going to have some less headaches along the way. Also, sorry, these animations didn't come in. So don't waste the opportunity. So we want to be better on the other side of the migration. Um, we want to, we're going to assess, some maybe restructure, um, potentially, hopefully, improve. Um, this, the same concept as when you're moving your apartment or your home. We want to start at the beginning, start in the source system and take a look at what we have. You don't want to pack up all your stuff, move it, and then start opening boxes and be like, why did I bother spending energy packing this, moving it? Um, the same concept applies here. We want to start uh, in the source and do, a, do an assessment of, of what we have. Abraham Lincoln once said, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first four sharpening the ax. Abraham Lincoln did not actually say that, but uh, <laughs> um, but some guy with an ax said that, and it still applies uh, very much to this scenario. So first, it's important to understand why you are migrating. It might be a technical reason. Um, 
many folks here at GupCon, in, you know, in this room maybe, but certainly in the Drupal community, are dealing with uh, Drupal 7 end of life. Um, you know, there's a moment where we're, folks are gonna be forced to you know, move on to a new platform via migration of some kind uh, because of a software end of life. So even if it's not Drupal 7, maybe it's uh, a different system that's reached end of life and you're moving into Drupal or you know, something else, but it, there's a technical reason. It could be a functional reason. A platform could have been selected um, for certain functionality that the business requires, that the organization requires, and it's gonna provide that. So that could be the reason. There also could be uh, a rebrand involved. Um, sometimes this is the cause, sometimes it's the effect of a migration. Um, oftentimes, because a migration is such a large amount of effort, uh, maybe a rebrand has been sort of pending, um, but your organization is like, well, we're not gonna spend all this effort to you know, implement a rebrand or redesign the old system and then have to do it a second time when we move to the new system. So it might get bundled together uh, or vice versa. It might be the catalyst that says like, well, we don't want to re-implement the same design that we've had for how many years um, in our brand new system. Let's package a redesign with this. Oh, sorry. Um, there could also be no um, platform change involved at all. Um, in a few moments, I'll talk about uh, continuous migrations, but we could just be connecting systems. So Dave mentioned our work with the John F. Kennedy Library, and in that project, we're actually connecting a digital asset management system to Drupal. Uh, so in that case, it's a continuous migration that is bringing content from the DAM system into Drupal. So that migration will run forever, essentially. Um, and we're, but because of the great tools that are provided in Drupal, Drupal's Migrate APIs, we're able to build a great system there to connect those two. So the answers to these questions are going to you know, affect the type of migration you choose, how you prioritize the work, uh, and a whole bunch of other bits along the way. So the first step is gonna to be to audit your content. Um, how many content types do you have is maybe the most important question that you're gonna ask yourself because that's gonna tell you how many different um, variants of structure you have to define. Um, you're also gonna ask how many content items are in each of those content types. This actually matters less than you might think, but it does matter. Um, but if you have 10 items versus a, uh, a million items, if you're writing a migration uh, for a content type, in theory it should work regardless of, of those two extremes. But if you have 10 items in a content type, I, you know, we might advise you as the client to just move those manually, have someone go and move those, instead of investing the effort in de writing, developing, testing, and running a programmatic migration. Uh, on the other end of the scale, if you have a million content items in a certain content type, you can probably expect a lot more edge cases in that, in that migration and in that content. It's, maybe it's been around a lot longer, maybe it's gone through multiple migrations, you know, it's been around for over a decade, something like that. So that's why there's so many content items there. That also means there might be more cruft to deal with. Um, but a migration is a great time to clean some of that up. Also, how the um, how the content is structured. Is it more uh, structured with fields that are more, you know, big blobs, big body fields that have all different kinds of data in them? Or is it more atomically structured with semantic fields um, you know, within there, how well, so how well is that source content structured? If it is a lot of blob type body fields, how much, um, you know, inline styles or markup are stored in there? Editors have a hard job, content editors have a hard job. They're trying to get their work done, and if that's the only tool they have, there's no shame on them for using it and getting, you know, and making, you know, making do with what they have. That said, we can learn from that and see the sins of the past and say like, okay, how can we do better going forward? This is the moment to do that, to figure that out. So to see that, to structure our new content types maybe a little bit differently so that they don't need to insert markup, insert styles, and then through the migration, clean that stuff up. 
we can programmatically strip some of that out, move it, to move based on our set new fields based on what we find, uh, you know, in each content item. So there's opportunity there. And then last but not least, what is your best content and why? Maybe there's some content types that didn't take off the way that your organization hoped they, they would. So you launch a new content type, you have high hopes for how it'll perform, and then it doesn't really resonate uh, in the way that you expect. So, um, you know, there's just, they're not in heavy use anymore. Maybe this might be that moment to say, let's deprecate those, let's remove those from the system so we're not dragging them forward um, and creating more, more to maintain in a brand new system. Um, this is the time to figure that out. So document what you've learned with these questions, share it with the stakeholders, get buy-in, because many of these things uh, require input, not just from the technical stakeholders, but from less technical stakeholders as well. So on that topic of improving your content, uh, as Mark was just talking about, um, after you've done this content audit, this initial content audit, how many content types, what are they? We can go a little bit deeper to think about how this content is organized. So we wanna look at things like how it's structured. Uh, what is working great and what isn't? Uh, is there any duplicate content that could be consolidated? Do you have multiple content types that are serving the same purpose that could be turned into the same content type? Uh, this is the time to take action um, take the time to answer these questions to, to really understand what we have. So what's performing the best, why, all of those types of questions. This is the question that I think we uh, find the most pushback to, but what can be left behind? And I understand GovCon, there are regulations about keeping content and archives, and that's somewhat of a separate conversation, but it's very valid to say what can be left behind. How, has your organization evolved? think uh, policy changes between administrations. You probably don't want the previous administration's policies on your new site. Maybe you do, maybe you don't, but those probably go into an archive. They don't get migrated. Uh, in our case here, they would get left behind. So has your target audience changed? Has your organization's focus shifted? Uh, is there content that no longer performs well? Is it not serving your, your mission so we want to make note of those and we want to, uh, as Mark used the analogy of moving, we don't want to move things that we don't need in our new home. So what can be organized differently? Similar to identifying the content that best serves your goals, we want to look at are there items that, are, that could be consolidated and organized in a better way? Can they be displayed in a way that are easier to find for your users? Is there something that's underperforming that's not getting bubbled up simply because of the content structure of your current site? This is a perfect time to analyze that data and you, the goals of your organization and ensure that we're putting them into the right place and into the right data structure as we do the migration. And this is gonna be where you work with your internal stakeholders to map everything out. Uh, a little bit of effort here is gonna go a very long way. A couple things that I don't actually have a great suggestion for for how to do this, but this is a good opportunity to improve tagging on your data. And when I say I don't have a great suggestion, is this is a place where we, we've started thinking, how could we leverage something like AI to help with our tagging and metadata? So it seems like a good opportunity to let the computers do the work and let your content editors have a break there. Uh, as Mark mentioned, uh, stripping out markup, but this is also a good opportunity to uh, extract embedded features. So something like a photo gallery, let's split that up into discrete content types uh, that can have their own metadata if it's not already that way. And then we could break down anything that is more complex into more manageable atoms that can be cross-referenced across the site. As we're thinking about our migration, are there new features that are gonna require architectural changes? So some of this organization, uh, the reorganization might give us an opportunity to create new features or there might be a new feature request that necessitates the data being restructured. So we wanna ensure that we're taking that into account the, to the best of our ability at this point in the process. Uh, we know that you're likely not going to have all the answers during this planning phase, 
but the more you can do, the closer you're going to get to that ability to be able to map the data structure properly. And knowing where you want to end up is 70% of the, the, the plan that you need to make. Uh, as I mentioned, we want to try to make the most out of automation. So this is the whole reason we have computers, really, is to automate tasks. So there's a lot of emerging AI tools. We're hoping that we can leverage those to make the most of uh, updating metadata or tags or anything along those lines. We want to take the time here to improve our taxonomy and uh, any other metadata, anything that can benefit SEO, paid search, social media strategies. We want to clean up our messy and unwanted HTML. So anything that is slowing down our site or getting in the way of our content editors, this is a great opportunity to, to clean that up. Things like video embeds or social media shares, anything in that realm. Uh, we want to strip away the unwanted markup to the best of our ability. Um, we want to make sure our uh, new markup is accessible and semantic. We want to identify and correct broken links. I'll talk about tools for that in just a minute. Uh, we want to organize our media assets along the way. And uh, an, again, another opportunity, Drupal's great at this, but let's use, uh, let's create derivative image sizes and crops for our images to, to improve our performance along the way. Highly recommend you check out Google's structured data website uh, dedicated to uh, all of their recommendations on how to set this stuff up. Turn it back over to Mark. So for each of your content types, you're gonna to wanna to map it out. You're gonna map out the, you know, how it's structured now. You're gonna design and map out how you imagine that you would like it to be structured in, in your new idealized world and in, in, uh, in your new system. Um, and flag areas that are gonna require change or manipulation. Um, some of those modification, a lot of those modifications you, I would, in, should I say a lot? <laughs> uh, many of those modifications you'll do during the migration as part of the um, migration effort. Um, but some you might want to do in the source data and some you might want to do post-migration once, uh, once you've migrated. Um, it really depends on the specifics um, and it depends on you know, what tools you have available. So if there's certain tool, if you're moving into Drupal, let's say, um, maybe there's certain tools or APIs that are gonna make your manipulation a, a lot uh, simpler in Drupal. So that might be a reason to say, well, let's, let's wait until the data is actually in Drupal and then we'll do the modification there. On the flip side, there might be stuff that you want to take care of in the source data before it ever, you know, starts moving to the new system. Um, so you'll evaluate that based on the tools that are available. Uh, so for example, on the Drupal side, Drupal Migrate, which is in core, is an incredible tool instead of APIs. There's also contributed modules that sit on top of that that can be uh, very beneficial. Um, on the WordPress side, there's um, modules like all-in-one uh, WP migration, WP all import. So tools like that um, that you should evaluate depending on your needs um, to find the best one for the job. So we're talking about migrations, but we do need to dovetail a little bit to talk about SEO. As we all know, anytime there's a migration, this is gonna come up, and it really should come up. Uh, this is a concern when you're moving between systems, and uh, there are some things we, we would recommend you consider along the way. So uh, we wanna try to avoid what we call SEO turbulence, uh, and there's always gonna be some. The question is, how, how much of it can we minimize? So we're gonna give some tips and tricks on, on what we think is the best here. I will just caveat this with Dave, personally, is not an SEO expert. I will give you the tips and the things that I know uh, to the best of my ability. So, but if you hit me with any hard questions afterwards, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass it over to one of the lullabots in the back. Uh, so first thing we wanna do is we wanna make sure we plan out our URL strategy. This is a big one, especially uh, if your URL structure is going to change. We wanna ensure that we have our 301 redirects set up. Uh, and then where possible, we wanna make sure we're not URL hopping. So if 
especially in a case where there's been a previous migration and you might have a stack of 301s that are already doing redirects for some of your content, we want to make sure to the best of our ability that content is only getting one hop. So hit this URL, you want to go to the new URL structure, but we're not going to two or three or four or however many are thrown in there. Uh, the best option is a single hop. We recognize that that is not always possible, but we want to we want to do the best planning we can to ensure that. Um, SEO best practices are always evolving, so this is sort of a moving target. Uh, Google has an entire site dedicated to what they are publishing and prioritizing. Google Search Essentials. Highly recommend you check that out. We rec that if you're doing a large migration that you have everybody on the team from your project managers to your developers review this site to make sure that everybody's on the same page and focused on uh, delivering the best SEO at the end as possible. I would just add that when we're talking about SEO here we're talking about semantic SEO we're talking yeah. about like uh, making sure that your content is structured in a way that um, you know is consumable <laughs> And, um, and approachable for search engines to index it um, effectively. So, you know, it all goes hand in hand when, when you're mapping out your content types and structuring them. This is, these are, this is one of the inputs uh, that we're looking at or, or what we're preparing for and accounting for when we're designing those content types and data structures to figure out like, okay, Let's make sure that you have great content. We're assuming that already. That's sort of the marketing side of SEO, which is like, well, how do we write the best content for SEO? Or how do we, you know, what's going to resonate? Or all those things. That's a different side of SEO. This is the technical side of saying, like, okay, starting from you have great content. You have content. How do we make sure that it's uh, indexable, findable by search engines so that it will be ranked appropriately? And we want to preserve that or hopefully even improve that as we're moving to a new system. Yeah, good point, Mark. Uh, the next point here is that performance is SEO. So building performant pages is one of the best things we can do for our structured SEO, let's say. Uh, and we wanna make sure we're considering this as part of our content migration. Another Google site, Google Core Web Vitals, recommend you check this out and familiarize yourself with some of their metrics like largest contentful paint, cumulative uh, layout shift, time to first bite. All of those uh, <coughs> metrics that Google is tracking, our goal is to uh, ensure that we are hitting at least as good, if not better scores after the migration. Uh, so there's a lot of tools you can use to track this, uh, but we definitely want to pay attention to that. We know that native uh, lazy loading is shipping on all major browsers and something like Drupal is gonna handle that out of the box. So that's one that you wanna make sure is working. And we wanna coordinate with our IT and infrastructure teams, especially if our underlying uh, hosting is changing. Or, you know, we know a lot of times migrations might, I know Mark said we're not talking about moving from one host to another, but a lot of times your underlying architecture is going to move or be on a new box somewhere. So we wanna make sure that the teams are coordinating and uh, paying attention and optimizing for these performance metrics along the way. One thing that we like to do with our clients is set a performance budget that is specifically related to ensuring that we're hitting these targets. Minimally, we wanna have a budget that's large enough on performance to ensure that there's no regressions. But where possible, we wanna have a slightly more aggressive budget just to improve our site performance because we know that's going to have an impact on our SEO and our end users and the new site. And Mark mentioned a rebrand. A lot of times, depending on your stakeholders or your constituents that are using your site, you might only get one chance to improve them, uh, impress them as you're rolling out your new site. So that next impression needs to be the best possible. So we want to be more aggressive where we can. And then uh, I mentioned making sure this performance budget is big enough to ensure we have no regressions, but we should have a little bit of space in there to ensure we can deal with some performance bugs as well. I wanna to clarify too, when we're talking about a performance budget, we're not talking about dollars. We're talking about like a set threshold um, that we are targeting to hit for performance on the site. 
and you know if we if the site regresses and crosses that boundary um, then we treat it as a bug so a very conservative performance budget would be uh, during a migration would be to not you know have the performance get worse than the current site that would be like the bare minimum and if for whatever reason you know um, you know could be a big uh, launch of a certain piece of functionality or it could be just a small individual commit causes us to cross that threshold we're treating that as a bug that needs to be resolved. A more aggressive performance budget would be saying like, well, our performance of our current site is unacceptable. Like we need a much more aggressive budget. Let's cut it by X percent and set it there. And, uh, and then that's where you're targeting. And anything that causes us to cross that, it's a bug. I still tie dollars to it. Yes. <laughs> uh, bookmarks more accurate <laughs> uh, so some great tools that we recommend screaming frog is a desktop tool that'll do an audit of your entire site it'll flag broken links it'll find multiple URL hops it'll check your metadata uh, I'm sure it does some other things Moz or SEO Moz it's a great online tool that does a lot of this it also includes some keyword uh, analysis and if you plug in it will do competitor research for you as well Ahrefs is a very similar tool to Moz. Uh, our business partner Chris likes it a little bit better based on its interface, and I think the pricing is marginally better, but it's very similar. And as we've mentioned, all the Google tools, you should be checking Google PageSpeed Insights uh, and monitoring your core web vitals. I don't know if this is in a later slide or not, but uh, there's a tool called Caliber which we use, which will track the Google Web Vitals over time, and you can share access with a dashboard to a client. We recommend using that along the way as well. So I alluded a little bit to this earlier, and I wanted to just define it a little more clearly on the different types of migrations. Um, so a cutover migration is how we refer to um, a scenario where all content is being moved. Uh, and launched at the same time um, versus a continuous migration uh, where parts of the content are migrated and live alongside legacy content until it can all be migrated to the new system or as I mentioned earlier like where a migration is never going to end it's going to con connect uh, two systems um, why is this important um, it's going to affect stakeholder expectations um, the sequencing of the work project planning and team structure so in a cutover migration, this is typically, um, this is probably the most common type of migration um, and certainly one that you're gonna use for sites with a, I don't wanna say smaller amount of content because as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, it could, we could go even smaller and say we're not writing a programmatic migration at all. But for a programmatic migration relatively, that would most likely be a cutover migration. Um, so you're going to prepare, write all of your migrations, test them all, um, and then the switch actually happens at one time. You schedule some kind of content freeze, run the migrations, switch DNS, or you know however you're getting uh, users from your old site to your new site. And this is way simpler from a technical perspective, but it's less agile. Um, less agile for migrations with many content types so you've got to figure out all of these things before you actually run them and launch them um, so, and it requires all these migrations to be complete before you do it so uh, as I mentioned it might require downtime um, but certainly some kind of content freeze um, so there are pros and cons there this is great for sites as I mentioned that have a more manageable amount of content so with a continuous migration, um, you're going to migrate bit by bit, uh, often by content type. Uh, so for example, if you had a site with many content types, and we'll just say, we'll just talk about articles and recipes, for example, you might you know, migrate and launch articles first. You begin serving articles uh, to your end users um, from the new site once you've migrated them, but you're still serving recipes from the old site. Your end users, in theory, don't have to know that there are two sites serving these two different content types. This, and then you move on to recipes and do the same thing, and then the next content type and the next content type. So um, the, 
<laughs> distracted me. Uh, um, <laughs> um, the, uh, this is more complex, um, but you need to, and you need to maintain both new and old infrastructure. Uh, but the, the upside is you get to learn and iterate from each content type and migration that you write and launch. So you're going to learn a whole heck of a lot when you create article migrations, run them and launch them, that then you get to go back and put into practice when you start your recipe migrations. Um, so this, this can also help mitigate some risks. Um, and it's super useful to show your work. You know, this is going to be able to especially if we're talking about migrations that um, are migration effort that could span a year, multiple years. The, one of the benefits of this that can sometimes outweigh the increased um, complexity is you get to show your work publicly, not just to your end users, but also to your executives, to your non-technical stakeholders. They get to see their work um, and see the progress that you're making as opposed to just being, you know, hearing from you. Well, we're we're halfway done writing the migrations. I, I swear, I, I think it's going well. Um, I think we've got it figured out. You actually get to test that in practice, and, and that, that's great for you and for them to be able to, to see that. OK, so we're going to kind of yada yada past the you did the migration. So <laughs> at this point, we've gotten the migration done. Uh, and. There's some things that we want to do to follow up to ensure that our migration was successful. So I talked a little bit about SEO. So one thing we want to do uh, throughout the whole process, before, during, and after, is monitor our SEO. So this is going to tell us one of the areas that we might need to focus on now. Uh, again, Google uh, Search Console or one of the other tools that I mentioned would be great. We want to monitor what's happening after migration has occurred. Uh, we want to monitor performance across the site. So some other tools that we recommend are updown.io, just track are the sites up or is the site up. Uh, let's not have a stakeholder emailing us, letting us know that there's an issue. Uh, we use New Relic for back-end and front-end performance monitoring and backtraces. Uh, Caliber, which I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, it's a great tool for monitoring the Google Core Web Vitals, and uh, you can set up different alerts, and uh, again, you can set a dashboard for your clients, it's, it's a great tool. And then Sentry for capturing log data, uh, and it's got some useful interfaces. I don't use Sentry, so I will let Mark explain this, because it is a great tool. Yeah, this is a, uh, a favorite tool of ours, whether you're doing a migration or not. This is a tool that will take uh, the errors and exceptions that are going into your uh, into your logs, and in this case, a Drupal log, but it doesn't. it's not necessarily, this isn't a Drupal tool. Um, you could tie it to anything, and it's going to give you a dashboard, allow you to create thresholds, alerting, um, and assignments of where the, you know, notifications of where these things will go. So essentially, you're taking uh, a step where um, errors that are occurring for your users, your editors, or your end users on the site, you don't have to wait for them to report those into you, to file a bug report, to contact you. You're getting alerted about them, you know, at the moment uh, that they're experiencing them. Um, or when they reach a certain threshold, and then you can turn those into tickets in your, you know, issue tracker or whatever tools you use. But you get to be proactive about that, um, and this is, has been great with our clients to be able to, you know, show them that we're not we're not waiting for um, users to report issues to us. We can identify those ourselves ahead of time uh, and resolve them proactively. So, I mean, this this is what that leads into is. Uh, to triage and resolve these issues iteratively, whether it be uh, issues in your migration, if you're doing a continuous migration, you're obviously going to iterate on the different content items. But even if you're doing a cutover migration, uh, issues are going to come up. Some you'll discover from uh, errors on the site that you, you are going to use Sentry to uh, find out about. Others you might hear about from stakeholders. But then you're going to iterate through those. Again, you have, you have a performance budget. You have a, you know, you're monitoring SEO, so it's just going to all, you know, go in a big circle essentially, and then you're going to repeat that as needed until you've met all your goals, your thresholds, uh, and um, 
and you're in a happy place and you've complete you can stand tall and be proud of your migration effort. So what have we learned today? Um, we've talked about tips and tools for planning your next migration, ways that you can uh, improve oh, excuse me, ways that you can improve your content along the way, um, how you can minimize SEO risk before, during, and after, um, how you decide on the type of migration, and then post-migration tasks, what you should be looking at monitoring and, and iterating on. I mentioned Drupal 7 earlier in the end of life um, as it relates to migration, but we also have a, a podcast uh, that we have produced. and uh, okay. <laughs> the uh, The... Um, the uh, Drupal 7 End of Life podcast, where we talk a lot about both technical and non-technical um, you know, aspects of it. We've had some really interesting guests on. We have uh, highlighted some new tools that have come out recently, uh, like Retrofit, where you can run Drupal 7 code in Drupal 10, um, as well as the uh, new Migrate Accelerate model, module that was recently open source that's helping with migration, adding new tools there. So there's a lot of interesting stuff going on to help folks get off of Drupal 7 wherever they're going to end up uh, when it reaches end of life. So check that out if you're interested uh, wherever you get your podcasts. And that's, that's what it. We have. Time for questions. You can find Mark on Mastodon. I'm not on Mastodon. And you can reach Chromatic on the, the X, I guess, Twitter. For form, formerly, <laughs> the artist formerly known as Twitter. And if you need to get a hold of me, it's Dave at ChromaticHQ.com. Feel free to shoot me an email. Any questions? questions? Sorry, I called you out, Katie. Yeah, and I'm going to repeat the question after. Two questions. Um, I think you mentioned a tool to find broken links. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't. Uh, it's, the question was about a tool to find broken links. There's a few, but uh, if I'm thinking of the same one, there's one called Ahrefs. Uh, screaming Frog. And Screaming Frog will help you find broken links. Okay. Thanks. Second question. Uh, well, next question. Um, you mentioned that you can archive certain parts of the website yeah. and not migrate it. Yeah. What would that look like? Is that is that like taking that content offline and saving it? The question was that we mentioned um, archiving certain parts of the website and not bringing it over to the new site and what uh, that might entail. Um, it could uh, be that. It could, I mean, the, really the it could be any one of 10 or more options. So, you know, you could flatten the pages and make them static HTML. There would be a lot of questions. If, if you and I were just talking about this, I might ask you, like, well, is it important that it, you know, that it still lives on the current, like, or seems like it still lives on the current site? Can we actually make it an archive? We could flatten the pages. Um, we also might, there might be um, certain data that you don't, think you need, but you're maybe not quite ready to completely be rid of it. Um, so there's different things that we might do to sort of hang on to that data, but not keep it in the, no like not build fields, full fields for each of them specifically. So I'm um, thinking of certain cases where we've um, taken like, let's say there's six fields on a certain content type that we don't think we need anymore, but we're not quite ready to really destroy that data, uh, I might take the data from those fields and just serialize them into a blob and then store them off to the side somewhere. So they're not going to get like, you know, you don't have six additional fields that are being loaded every time you load a node in Drupal. Uh, you could even, in theory, you know, in that example I'm thinking of where we actually did, kept, still kept it in Drupal, but it was just we turned six fields into one, hit it from the editorial UI or made it non-editable by editors, so um, basically so we could go back and get it programmatically later if we needed it, but you could also like store it in a completely separate system and just still relate it to the UUIDs of the content that's in Drupal. So there's a lot of options, um, but I, you know, what I know that I'm trying to drive at is like to approach that with an open mind and be like, what could we be rid of, or what could we like? You know, it's you're not tied to just preserving everything the way it way it is. Is I think how I would recommend approaching it. I think the other bit is it's going to depend a little bit organizationally, and what is the requirement. So, in another conversation this week, somebody was talking about 
like governance and saying we have to keep an archive of everything. But one of the recommendations was just print it all the PDF. Now that seems miserable to me, but it would be a way to fully archive a site. Now, can you do that programmatically? Probably. Uh, but the question is, like, what is the requirement? Is there a legal reason driving it? Is there just a stakeholder wants it? Um, Mark's suggestion of serializing the data and tying it to the node, I think that's a great option to just have it as a, we can get to the data if we need the data. But again, there's a question like, do we need it preserved in the way it was displayed or do we need the data preserved? So those are the kinds of questions we'd be asking. Uh, the question was that we mentioned using AI potentially for tagging, um, and if we could give more details or other er, other areas that we might use it. I can't give that many details because we haven't done much of it yet. It's it's an area that we're interested in and seems like a good use case for the large language models that are you know have, that have been coming out and like what they are good at. So it seems like. Uh, especially for organizations um, with a lot of data, if you could potentially like train uh, a, an LLM on that data, then you could get, in theory, a, you know, highly um, valuable, highly accurate uh, results on tagging. Um, you know, as good or maybe even better than a human editor could do if we're talking about like large amounts of data um, that's the like the thing I would have the so today that I might have the most confidence in like trying to deploy that at other things that I might have less confidence but maybe interest in would be like summarizing certain content um, um, writing even populating like certain types of fields I'm thinking about uh, when we submitted this talk, and we thought, you know, we just submitted a talk for DrupalCon. You, you know, anyone who has, who's ever done that, you go to these forums, and there's essentially like, you know, you have your, you know, session description, but then there's a bunch of other fields that are like similar but not quite. Like, tell us what you're talking about in a shorter version, or if a version that is, um, you know what people are going to learn, uh, you know, so there's different like variations that they want a specific answer for. Like if, if we had a site like that, there might be an opportunity to, you know, use an LLM or AI to, to do that. And I just want to say that this doesn't necessarily have to be something that is like just done without oversight on large swaths of data. This could be something that, you know, an editor is on a piece of content, they've created a piece of content, they might use AI to get suggestions that then they approve or not or edit on their own. So that would make them potentially, you know, more efficient, you know, better, you know, when, you know, make their lives easier so they're not starting from scratch. Um, but I don't necessarily always see it as like, oh, now you don't need a human for this. It's like, it's also, it can just help us do our jobs a little bit more efficiently. Sorry, I was texting a friend that does AI modeling to see if he had a recommendation. Any other questions? Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you.